Hi, I'm Josh Harris, Associate State Director of Advocacy and Outreach with AARP Illinois. Welcome to the 2021 Gallery Gachard Virtual Trolley Tour. AARP Illinois is proud to sponsor the Virtual Trolley Tour as a celebration of Bronzeville's vibrant community. Gallery Gachard and its partner galleries are essential to preserving the cultural heritage of Bronzeville. We'd like to take a minute to remind all Illinoisans that AARP Illinois fights every day to advocate for affordable housing, affordable health care, community safety, and community development. Just this past year, we launched our multi-year Disrupt Disparities Initiative, which focuses on advocating for laws to bring about necessary change to older adults of color all across the state. Already in 2021, we're proud to report legislative wins that expand retirement access to more than 1 million more Illinois residents, expanding telehealth options, which we know were so critical during the COVID-19 pandemic, expanding property tax relief for older adult homeowners, and creating more diversity on the Illinois Broadband Advisory Council. By continuing to support communities in this way, AARP wants to ensure that residents can age in place in multi-generational communities where their history can be celebrated. To learn more about AARP, visit aarp.org il. Enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to another open studio and a virtual trolley here at the Phantom Gallery Chicago Network. I'm Alpha Breton, I'm the Chief Curator for the Phantom Gallery. This month of October, we're going to feature artists that have narratives in their stories and that they create storyboards around partnerships with poets. The work that I'm going to present are a series that were created during Echoes of Our Journey, an exhibition that Gallery Fischard when featured artists that did stories of the mi great migration. And so I'm exhibiting them um, and what the, the storyboards are in the partnership with the poets are from the book, The New Negro Poets USA, and it's forwarded by Gwendolyn Brooks in 1966. Poetry and the poems that talked about migration and movement. I created the drawings and illustrations um, and I did a window, um, which will feature during this exhibition, and the window was an original uh, door and windows from this building that belonged to the Jones Brothers. And um, all of the artists were challenged to do and tell the narrative and the story of the Great Migration in their work. And so I did these collage pieces, but I also did these narratives that I didn't get a chance to exhibit and are finished. Every Negro poet has something to say. His mere body, for that matter, is an elegance in his quiet walk down the street. Is a speech to the people. Rebuke is a plea, is a school. So I took excerpts from the book and, and, and excerpts and build my themes and my drawings um, around those. And they were influenced by James Weldon um, Johnson and his art form. And we'd like you to uh, join us with the pop-up research station every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, and 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The cafe, it's just casual talk, networking, and conversation. Um, we'll send you out a link, or you can check our blog at Phantom Gallery Chicago, blog.com. You can also go to our blog talk radio, which is creative conversation and listen to podcasts and artists talking about their work. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors for contributing to the Phantom Gallery during the pandemic. Hi, today we have um, for our open virtual trolley tour, uh, LaVon Pettis. And she joins us from her studio on Dorchester. Hi, LaVon. Hey, Alpha, how are you doing? I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm really interested in what you're doing and what you're up to. Uh, I'm gonna let you do the introductions and talk about your trajectory um, in, your, in your career. Okay. My name is LaVon Pettis. So I was born in Chicago, Illinois. However, my mother relocated our family to Bloomington, uh, the heart of central Illinois. Um, growing up in Bloomington, 
at an early age, um, I realized it was just such a different place. Um, it's like this co corporate collegiate kind of hybrid. You know, you have a lot of various companies, but I got my first start there at the age of 10. I was a delivery associate for the newspaper called the Panagraph. And the area that I delivered papers for, um, I had a lot of college students. I had a lot of uh, corporate clients in addition to homeowners and renters. And so I kind of got a mixed development kind of neighborhood because I lived in a mixed development. So it was the community that I lived in. And there I learned to interact with people from all sets, right? And being able to engage them with where they are. Um, and it taught me some skills about selling and retention of clients. And so I was able to take those skills and apply them later on. Um, and that has helped with my trajectory and helped with uh, me building relationships and networks uh, within the arts industry, but as well as the work that I've done in politics and culture and things like that. So um, that's a big gap and you left a, a gap out, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of when I first met you and what we were doing in terms of the curatorial practice. Um, okay, um, when I first met you, that was the, uh, I was doing some work for the Sierra Club. I was actually their community um, and volunteer recruiter for the Sierra Club. And I had become introduced to their work working in Springfield. Um, I was working as a lobbyist at the time. And so um, I was asked for a campaign to help bring a organization in that was sequester coal through black and brown communities in Chicago. And I took uh, a bit of a, a hard stance. I didn't want to be associated with that. I was thinking about my daughter, uh, her friends, their future, my daughter being raised on the South side of Chicago in a, at the time, predominantly black community. And so um, I declined that offer. And because I declined it, that um, introduced me to the Sierra Club and they were actually campaigning to take a lot of those uh, coal companies offline in Illinois. So I started doing some volunteer work with them. And then um, we were doing a campaign where we were imploring Mayor Rahm Emanuel to um, you know, take into consideration um, the whole clean energy campaign. And so you were having creative conversations through the Phantom Gallery. And so we were able to link up and cross pollinate and I remember we had this amazing session where uh, you helped Indigo design her sign and all of that. And um, I still have that photo of her. Yeah, I used that photo as well, so. Good, good. Yeah. And then from there, um, that project that you're talking about is um, Creative Currency. Creative and myself Currency. and artist Carol Henry which lives in Clinton, Maryland, we took this whole cross country uh, project where we were gleaning yard signs, you know, political yard signs <laughs> and repurposing them with, our, uh, with words of civility, words of, you know, positive affirmation because the climate, the political climate was so strong with and that whole racism and equity um, and restorative justice issues were, um, and then 99% camps were, you know, kind of blowing up all across the country. So we went um, from California to uh, Crystal City, Virginia with that campaign. So your uh, yard sign that um, you use for your campaign was part of that uh, oh, performance nice. piece or that piece that traveled. And we installed them over on Logan Square during Chicago Artist Month on a, one of the mental health buildings that was um, closed down under Rahm Emanuel. Uh, so all those, those posters were up on that wall. Um, 
and that our final installation. So you did contribute, you know, to that that project. So from there, you know, you, you started doing this curatorial practice. You came to when I moved into Bronzeville with the Phantom Gallery. You came over. We started talking and got this opportunity to be part of uh, Miami Art Week. And um, you know, you can talk about that because all of these things are your curatorial practice and you were representing at the time. The jar. jar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing that I found, so my major was community counseling psychology. So talking about the mental health piece, um, I came to Chicago because I wanted to study under Dr. Carl Bell. May he rest in peace. I had the opportunity to do my intern and practicum with him. When I graduated in 2010 from Chicago State University with my master's degree, all of the mental health institutions were uh, having their funding cut. And so someone, uh, Senator Donnie Trowder, knew that I had a background um, as a student lobbyist. So I was in that same building with Senator Trowder uh, and Dr. Carl Bell doing my internship. And so I was referred to a lobbying firm. But what I found out in my undergrad studies, when I went to community college, I started off at Joliet Junior College, uh, I became a model for the art department. And I realized that uh, with my research studies, with the kind of work um, that I was doing, I think I worked for two or three departments at the time for, for the college, that being in the art department was my therapy. And watching the students develop their work and watching um, the professors teach their work, all of that just became like so such a relief for me. So um, fast forward to when I'm in Springfield and things, and I said I was working on the political um, as a lobbyist, that um, doing that art project for the Sierra Club and with you and the sign making, um, the creative currency, that was, that was real therapy for me. That was a real application of a healing process. Because again, I'm coming out of Springfield, taking a stance that I won't go along with a specific campaign that, you know, could have took care of me and my daughter for a very, very long time. To, you know, leaving the firm that I was with, uh, having a loss, a tremendous amount loss of income, and then, you know, volunteering and trying to figure out how I was going to uh, make, make my bills every month. So I was able to land on my feet as a consultant and um, taking the skills that I had into the art world. So I met Najjar um, during my undergrad. I was a model for the art department, as I mentioned. And Najjar being a Muslim artist, um, he was concerned because I was the human drawing model. And he felt that there were two human drawing models for the entire department and both of them were black women. And so, we had a dialogue about the difference between aesthetic and erotic art, you know, and the boundaries that those things cross. Um, we talked for, for so long and it was such a uh, emotionally stimulating conversation that later on I started auditing one of his classes, his class on the history of um, African-American artists. And I sat in on those classes and then eventually later on, uh, his wife came to me and she asked me if I would consider uh, working with a jar in the management capacity. So um, I was able to, uh, once again, take some of the skills that I had and leverage that, you know, for later on. Um, I didn't start really, really realizing um, my growth in, in, in that art medium until I started having a lot of high profile clients like Najjar Musawir, like uh, brother Kalan Phil Koran, uh, Oba William King, the storyteller. I did some work with Sidhar Weber, with Alpha, uh, in addition to all of the various artists that came through the Phantom Gallery that we were able to engage in, in Miami and um, other places. And then looking at just like 
art continued to be that therapy to uh, trauma to um, dealing dealing with the circumstance of living in an urban environment, right? It just really became like, oh, if my workload gets too much, I'm gonna go to an artist's studio and see, you know, what he or she has going on. I'm gonna talk to an artist about some art. Like, I love the dialogues that I have with artists because, you know, not only is it um, very liberating, but it's also very scientific. And I like tech talk. It's so sexy to me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like even in my common language, it's like, if we people start talking about, you know, programming and iteration and algorithms and mathematical sequences, I'm like all stimulated. Like I would go to the MCA and see like a Howard Dina Pendel or, you know, go to the NAMD gallery and see a Richard Hunt. And I would be fascinated by those artist talks. Carrie James Marshall, I think I've tried to go to like every talk that he's, you know, as, as that I could make it to in this city. You know, I just kept showing up in art spaces. Ooh. I did, go ahead. No, 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 I'm really, uh, so I know you're building to where you are now. Um, right. And it's a really interesting talk. So go, go ahead. So, so like I said, I kept showing up in art spaces, but then I realized um, I moved into an, an art centered community and started, you know, working with you and you were doing things on um, the arts and its role in development. And so from there, I started leveraging, I feel my creative voice more. And when I say leveraging it more, I started writing about how I felt about the arts and its role in development. So I wrote an article for Global Creativity Magazine. Um, I did a talk at the MCA. I mean, there were a lot of things that happened. Now, the interesting thing about this is that um, those articles are no longer online. Because I think at the time I was critiquing things that people were a lot more sensitive about. And because I didn't come from the uh, academy, you know, people were looking at how, who are you to have some feedback? But I felt like I'm a consumer. This thing is impacting me in some capacity. It's fear of influence, like definitely uh has its its place amongst you know my development my cultivation and all of those things and here's how I feel about it now whether or not that was welcome or not I realized like in the time we are in 2021 now the conversations that I was having back then in 2013 14 15 are more welcome now than they were back then but this is post, you know, uh, revolution of, you know, 2019 or 2020, you know, post all of those things that happened. So now people are talking more about uh, blackness and space and um, development and disinvestment and gentrification. And, you know, what I'm saying like outside of just academia. Like these are community conversations that are happening and that are very critical. So um, in that, I, I think for a while I felt some kind of way like, oh my goodness, like back in the day, like is my voice being stifled if I'm writing these articles for these major institutions and then the articles are disappearing or no longer available. I felt like, you know, um, I questioned if I was being blackballed, you know, for, you know, making my own observations. And I've always considered myself, I would start off as a social scientist, you know, not just because of my major, uh, because of my practice. And um, I've worked in so many different sectors that I feel like I don't know it all, but I have a 
good understanding from the ground level of a few things. So now you're at Wow Yam. Yes, so I applied for the Wild Yams residency last year. Um, and I was able, I was selected as a participant. So it's a residency for single mothers, aunties. I mean, it has be, become like a real supportive network for me. Um, they offered us the opportunity for space at CoLab, which was originally um, in South Shore. Um, currently, um, we just finished a residency at the Creative Room, which was uh, started by a Black female architect right here in the Park Manor neighborhood. Um, and it offers studio space for you know emerging established and becoming artists. And so it gave me an opportunity to go outside of my home and, you know, really collect my thoughts and work on my project. Because, you know, at home, you can get distracted by so many things, you know, if it's not your phone or the Internet or, you know, whatever you just got going on in the daily rigmarole, people coming to your door, all of these things. Right. So, um I really feel like I was able to thrive in, in going over to both CoLab and the creative room to do the work that I needed. And this week um, on Friday, this past Friday, we opened an exhibition at the Silver Room. And so with this exhibition, uh, the theme was labor. And so again, me going back to uh, some of the the training and research that I love uh, because at one point my my psychology degree was focused in applied research um, and I worked in the research lab so in me going back to that I started looking at um, the relationship between labor and leisure and so there's this whole um, economics theory that looks at labor and how when people make less money, according to the theory, they sometimes take more leisure activities for themselves. But according to the theory, like the more money that people make, um, the more production that comes into play. And so people become more focused on working more hours and so they have a tendency to take less leisure the reason i wanted to examine that theme um with within the context of of my projects actually had to do with my daughter indigo uh because i realized like for the most part of her life um a lot of our vacation time or the times where we went out the city and we went to these various places, was always connected to me working. Even right now, I have an um, opportunity to go to Toronto in a few weeks for the Vegandale Festival. Um, and I'm like, wow, this would be my first trip to Toronto, but it's work related, right? And so within that context, I had to find a way to carve out um, leisure time. So there was this time I, um, I'll, I'll remind you, Alpha, when we were in Miami and um, we went to go see the creators of Expo, Expose Magazine um, from Beijing, China. And we went to meet with them and we met with them like on the beach. Well, that was our first time going to the beach out of the entire time we had been in Miami. You know, because we were working in Overtown, we were more concerned about uh, getting the exhibition up, you know, getting these things uh, done and all of that. So my daughter um, would always make a place for her to play amongst the work that I was doing. And sometimes that didn't um, go well, you know, with me. I remember there was a time we went to the Namdi uh, gallery, 
when they were in Chicago and they had Richard Hunts there. And my daughter tried to like climb and run around each of Richard Hunt's sculptures. Like she honestly felt that these were playground pieces. She was fascinated by the work, you know, but thinking about like the fact that she felt it was play, you know? And so um, I was signifying about that, about how, you know, uh, Richard, Pry Rich pardon me, not Richard Pryor, Richard Hunt should make pieces for, for playgrounds. Um, and throughout Illinois for, for a few years. And lo and behold, here we are now in 2021 and the Chicago Architect Biannual just went and they redeveloped a bunch of lots throughout the city for playgrounds, a bunch of vacant lots. So just looking at the progression of, of those things, you know, like how do we make, um, how do we, for the youth, bring them to the dialogue when you have someone whose work is already established, that they can connect to it. Um, so, yep, I'm at the Silver Room right now on exhibition until December with the rest of the Wild Yams. I would invite everyone to come out and meet the cohort. So the pieces that I created, Alpha, uh, for it, like I said, dealt with labor and leisure. So I looked at in me making art in the last year for myself, um, it's been a very spiritual battle. I mean, I feel like I'm dealing with spiritual warfare within my own self. Like I said, the anxiety that I developed about uh, presenting the work, talking about the work, even though, like, like I said, I've always been a very vocal, um, I was known throughout the state for my influence. Um, and here I am now, like nervous about, you know, showing some work when I've been modeling since I was like, <laughs> you know, since I was like nine months. <laughs> So um, for this body of work, I focused on that. And so in the aspect of leisure, labor and leisure, I realized that I came to um, a point where I had to put on this armor. You know how um, in spiritual practices, they talk about putting on an armor of like the creator. And so I felt like I was putting on that armor in making art. And so in doing that, pardon me, excuse me, in doing that, um, I looked at, um, for, this, for this exhibition, the uh, Shibori technique, which is a uh, Japanese, I believe. Um, I believe it's a Japanese uh, tie dyeing technique. Yes. It's a yes. of the fabric, because I used to teach that. It's a yes. folding of the fabric, uh, right. and the tying of the fabric, and then placing it in the dyes. Right. And so the reason why I liked um, the folding of the fabric, I took a workshop with, uh, I, did, I took the Shibori Technique workshop at Marwin um, here in Chicago, and it was through the Family Advisory Board. So it was the place my daughter took free art classes at but they would get the parents together or guardians or whom, and then we would do workshops in art making practice ourselves. And so um, in, in, in dealing with this technique with my, my daughter and her friends, I realized that the folding technique reminds me of the psychological uh, test for schizophrenia. Like the ink blocks that people, yes, used to take. So with that, um, and also with another workshop that I did, I realized that I was really stimulated by the various prints that ended up in the fabric and what those prints are interpreted as by the human mind. So again, tying in my background in psychology. So 
These are handkerchiefs. These handkerchiefs are about, sorry, I had to take them out the bags and unfold them. I had to iron them again, but about my um, blood, sweat and tears, you know, you need a hanky to, 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 to wipe your face um, <laughs> when you're out there laboring. But we also use handkerchiefs in our leisure activities. You know, you might see it in um, someone's outfit or things like that. And so attending like a, a wedding or something, you know, the man might have a handkerchief within it. So that's why I chose um, this medium with the silk handkerchiefs. Um, as you can see, when I first started off, like the first iteration, right? Um, everything turned out pink. So there was this dialogue that I had with um, architect Amanda Williams the other day, who was known for her color theory about how I used a little bit of that cherry. I believe Amanda calls it Kool-Aid red, right? I used a little bit of cherry, but yet it dominated so much in the fabric. I mean, everything was pink. I was so upset, especially after like washing the material and then drying the material, letting it like hang dry, I, you know, and then trying to speed up the process and, and, and dry it in a dryer. It saturated everything. So this is the second iteration. And as you can see, I've got more of a dominant blue color here, but I had to go back and not apply so much cherry or take the cherry and drip it just a little bit. Cause I mean, half a little, you know, tinkle tinker of cherry just, it did so much. In addition to that, um, I made scarves. So talking about labor and leisure, uh, scarves um, protect your neck, right? Spiritually. Um, when you talk about putting on the breastplate of something, of an armor that, that, that can help you. And so these scars are um, to me a bit androgynous because it can be worn by men or women. Men can double it up like, or people can double it up like I have on my neck or you can wear it like a veil, right? And so um, I don't have any on me right now because they're at their shops, but there are also these veils that I made. So in dealing with this, there were three different types of materials that I used, uh, silk, rayon, and cotton. Um, in, in that process, I learned that some people love the silk a lot more it's like as far as, um, but then there are other people who really appreciate the cotton. Now I have to figure out how to, and look, look, at, look at those patterns in there. So Levon, we lost your, uh, we lost your image. Okay, there you go. Sorry. All right, 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 yeah. And so for each person that looks, like for me, when I'm looking at this, it reminds me of like the all seeing eye mm -hmm. or the cosmos or that burst of like, there's a tinge of like this, this blackness in there, right? And then from all of that, all of these other colors are like emitting, you know? And then from that, when I think about concepts of how the universe created was, you know, started or um, how all colors come from black and thinking about those things. Um, it really like this trips my mind out, <laughs> you know? So I've now tried to um, expound upon that by looking at what are the different materials that I can use when using the shibori technique. So um, when we took the workshop at Marwin, we didn't just use rubber bands. 
which most people with the little tie dyeing kits, it's just a rubber band. Like we're using all kinds of things like little pieces of wood. I've been using screws, you know, uh, money. Like, buttons. Uh, yes. Buttons interesting. Uh, yes. Yeah. And I didn't try any buttons. So try, try some buttons. Uh, I will try some buttons, you know. Um, and again, this, this has to deal with, so this was our, my first product. Like I said, the scarves, the handkerchiefs, um, and the veils. So the veils being for protecting your head. And the veils are like the wave caps that you see. Um, most people, you can get them at the beauty supply store. You see people wearing out, you know. Um, now, the interesting thing about that was <laughs> looking at developing a product where you might get something and it's a one size fit all, but then through a process of like dyeing the material, drying the material, all of that, it might shrink you know? Um, so thinking about that, because most of my head scars now look like they're for, for children. <laughs> so um, I'm also looking at other materials that I could acquire to, to do this technique on. Um, as I mentioned, this exhibition is up until December. So it gives me a lot of time to play with a lot of different material and figure out um, how I can build upon it to make, ultimately, I want a product um, that will sell. The first night I did, I sold three pieces. Uh, I was very grateful at the Silver Room. It was my first time there with my cohort. Um, and it was three pieces of work that I made with some help from my daughter, Indigo. And I just oh. want to thank her. <laughs> good, 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 because all of this is coming full circle. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk because we have just a few minutes left um, and talk about your knuckle up. What's that about? So that, that painting was honestly very symbolic of um, what you need intestinal fortitude uh, to survive this pandemic. So um, I was given a grant through the Illinois Humanities um, for the envisioning justice. And so in that grant process, I was exploring my um, adolescence and being a derelict youth and how that shaped me, you know, like for things later in life, how I had to, you know, straighten up and get myself together uh, because I was on a downhill trajectory you know and so um the knuckle up piece is about i revisited my past like things that and relationships and people that i might communicate with um less frequently than i do now in my life and so in opening those doors and providing access to yourself again or rekindling old relationships, right? You realize like why you can't continue on with certain things. You see what I'm saying? Yes. And so that knuckle up was like, I've always been, been given some kind of choice, right? Even when it was a bad deal. It was whether or not I chose to negotiate or accept it. And sometimes when you go against your intuition, right? So in knuckling up, I had experienced several deaths um, on my paternal side um, in the interviews. And I have more interviews that I just haven't put out online. There's this huge conversation between my father and I about his lack of being present at certain junctures of my life. And then me coming to terms with all of that unfinished business. So I feel like I've kind of hoarded those conversations. Like I had put, in, put started putting them up online and then it, it got so raw and so candid that I, it froze me. And so now I've had to go back 
and re-listen to all of those interviews and, and knuckle up and be able to release that because I realized that in order for me to heal that I have to go through the process and sometimes process includes pain it, it includes uh things that make it make you feel like it breaks you all the way down you know but it's getting that through that breakthrough that catharsis you know what I'm saying because one thing that I've always known like if I needed to have a conversation with my father about anything that I could have that dialogue with him so even though he might not have been there to go to my Girl Scout meeting when I was, you know, five years old that I wanted to show him off to all of the Caucasian girls, <laughs> you know, to show that I had a father, right? Um, even if he didn't make it, that um, when it came down to some critical times that I needed him, he was and has been there for me. So, yeah, that, is, that has been... That has okay. been a something else. Well, congratulations on that Humanities Project. I'm really uh, looking forward to seeing more about that and hearing more about that and listening to the recordings once you release them. And Thank so you. again, we talk about things that are full circle. There's another series where in your college time, you were modeling in art classes and now you're modeling again. So you wanna talk a little bit about that series that you, you're working on? But Donnie is the actual artist that's, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah so um I will share my first professional modeling gig I was nine months old um my grandmother was a um secretary for George uh Joseph and Associates George Siegel and Associates I know it's, she she worked for both companies but I think this was for George Joseph um and uh, I was selected. They needed a, a black child, an Asian child, a white child. It was for like a pharmaceutical company. I'll send you an image of that. Um, and so when I got into community college, I really, you know, I was first generation low income. Um, I had came from having a GED. I didn't have initial scholarships. I just went to community college because I was court ordered to go to school and seek some higher education. And so um, I decided that um, I'd make money and the highest paying job, like I said, I had maybe two or three jobs. Uh, I was a tutor, I worked for the women's college, but the highest paying job was a modeling for the art department. So. Mm -hmm. It was, it was good money. I mean, it might've been back in the day, like $15 an hour. And we're talking about 2001, you know? So I was like, this is, this is great at the time. And so that really helped offset uh, some of my basic needs in providing the income that I needed. And so it became a very, very popular thing um, when I was modeling for these art departments, so Joliet Junior College, then I went on um, to become a model for uh, Southern Illinois University Carbondale that, you know, people would come to those classes because they wanted to see me, right? And that was something, that was something in itself. Like I said, it started this whole uh, engagement between the JAR and I and us and our communication um because I wasn't one of his students so um throughout my career I've I've modeled for different artists there was a time where I worked with uh Tyrell Slang Jones and he was hosting private uh studio visits with um human drawing you know figure drawing models and I was one of the models and like I said it's it's been good money but it also gives me an opportunity to see myself from someone else's perspective and see uh, how they insert you within that. So I've always felt like I've seen myself in art and 
been a part of the arts, but this was even more. Um, so I stopped, I, I feel like I stopped doing the human drawing modeling, maybe after my daughter got into kindergarten, um, because I was just more concerned with, um, I mean, we had like, I had new paintings in the house, but then when your daughter gets older, right? And her friends want to come over, <laughs> you know, and you're concerned about like, having all these new drawings right around the home and how that might be interpreted by your friends or their parents who might be of another belief system or faith you know what i'm saying and how that can be seen and so i decided well you know what i'm gonna put these paintings up right and if i do these paintings i'm not going to show them um too much to the public but they'll go out to private collectors and then um, at the beginning of the pandemic um, and after my grandmother and cousin passed away, I was just really struggling with a lot of grief, um, especially watching how uh, Indigo uh, was feeling about it. You know, it was a lot of grief, her father passing a few years ago, then my paternal grandmother, my cousin, who she was very close to. And so in us struggling with that, um, I went to Donnie Carter and I said, hey, you know, there's a series you did. Well, first we talked about quick sketches. And so he started doing all of these different drawings of me. And I think a collector came by his house and saw it and was like, oh, this is amazing, blah, blah, blah. And then like some years before I had came across one of Donnie's um, pieces that he did in 1970, he did these pieces on velvet that the pieces on velvet, um, they hung in nightclubs throughout Chicago. So I, there was a man actually walking down the street in my neighborhood with this painting over his, his head and it was raining. And this painting is on black velvet. And so I was driving. I had somebody in a car with me. Uh, I was an Uber driver. I hurry up and pulled over and was like, hey, I know this artist. And the guy's like, I'm trying to sell this painting. The guy was in a crisis. I think I gave the guy, you know, some money for it. I know I gave him some money for it. And he gave me the painting, but it was ripped in half. And so when I showed the painting, even with it being ripped to some of my collectors, they were like, I'd like to acquire one. So with Donnie and I starting to work together, um, I said, Donnie, can we revisit this series? And he said, yeah, I just need a model for it. And I'm like, I'm the model. And so we started creating these pieces. And um, as of date in the show at the creative room last week, I sold one. There's another young lady who is coming to buy one. I sold it to this amazing uh, dancer that is really emerging here out of Chicago. And I'm very excited that she saw the piece and decided that she wanted to have it in her home, you know? And thinking about, uh, because these pieces do deal with some nudity. It is human drawing, you know, uh, figure drawing, um, and how that there is a population of people who do want those kinds of pieces in their home and who do celebrate the art and the beauty of a woman's body, you know. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful way to end our uh, conversation. And, uh, you know, I guess, again, everything is full circle for you. And uh, congratulations on your newfound, uh, what is, can I say, artistic, being an artist that you were. Thank you. you know, so in, in, what, excuse me, Alpha, what do I do about, do you have, get anxiety about presenting work and making work? And all like, what do I do with, okay. All the time that's just it that's just a part of it you know okay of um that's just a part of what we go through because um I don't like people looking over my shoulder when I paint and that whole anxiety about how people perceive your work in an exhibit 
um, how they walk past it. Uh, if you're in a group show, it, you know, who they favor, you know, when they're looking at someone else's work. So that whole anxiety, I don't even want to stand by the art, you know what I mean, when I'm in the gallery openings, because it's just so, when you come to the Phantom Loft, you'll see more of other artists that I collect than you see my own work, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been because of the belief that you don't, you stifle your growth if you have your own artwork around you, you know, on the walls and hanging, you stunt your own growth um, as an artist uh, and limit your palette, you know, so, but yeah, yeah, it doesn't go away. <laughs> that's interesting because in the musicians who I've worked with, like when I worked for Phil Coran, mm -hmm. most of the time, like he would, when he was creating music, he didn't listen to anybody else's music. He couldn't audio, like, be able to process anybody else's stuff because he only needed to focus on creating his own. So I'm just saying, like, that difference in musicians and, like, and in, in art and in, in artists and that uh, thinking about, like, well, in art, you do surround yourself with everybody else's art. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you do. You do. So. You do. Again, thank you for uh, our conversation and, and coming to us with the virtual open studio. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I hope you all buy some work from the Silver Room. And uh, Alpha, I hope me and you can quid pro quo, you know, exchange a piece. And yeah, okay. we'll figure it out. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.